Hello to all of those of you who are in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in central Pennsylvania, in the great Commonwealth state, and within the sound of my voice and image. I am Linwood Sloan. I have the privilege and the continuous opportunity to represent the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism here in the capital city of Pennsylvania and one of two IIPT peace parks in Pennsylvania. I would like to share with you that the goal of the peace parks is to find common grounds in communities and shared places where we can come together for fellowship, civic dialogue, and cultural exchange to build programs upon that site which encourage individuals to collaborate, to conserve, preserve, restore and rededicate important shrines, monuments, and images on the site, to honor exemplars of peace and progress, and to connect allied organizations who are developing and encouraging equity, parity, and justice in their communities. It is my great privilege to introduce to you Dr. Louis de Lamour, the founder and CEO of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism. Dr. Lamour, welcome. What was your uh, first spark of your vision for the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism? Well, the first thought was actually uh several years before that and uh, I was promoting the idea to leaders of the industry in Canada and the response was what's tourism got to do with peace? Peace that's government's job. So I continued working on it uh, over the next few years and uh, in 1985-86 terrorism peaked and uh, we were futurists, my, my consulting firm, uh, were futurists to the tourism industry in Canada. And we did the most in-depth study of the impact of terrorism on tourism anywhere in the world. And that ended up being published uh, in the Business Quarterly, which is the most prestigious journal, business journal in Canada. And the editor sent copies of the article uh, to 100 of the top uh, industry leaders in Canada, government and private sector. And uh, soon uh, there began an appreciation that without peace, there is no tourism. Tourism around the world went down significantly after those uh, terrorism in incidents in 1986. So uh, with that, we began to get support for a first global conference in Vancouver in 1988. Uh, there was a, a meeting of the Travel Industry Association of Canada and they unanimous, unanimously supported the idea and that's how Peace Through Tourism began. Well, an exemplar of peace, I think, is someone who uh, contributes their life to supporting initiatives uh, regarding peace within our communities, peace with one another locally and, and uh, inclusiveness, uh, peace with our environment our, and our, uh, uh, our uh, uh, home, planet Earth. Uh, and and um, I, I'd like to mention that I, I think one of the things you uh, were, were noting, uh, who, who would be exemplars of peace for uh, the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism. And over the years, we've named uh, several persons as men of peace. Um, and these include Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Dean Hussein of Jordan, and Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, Secretary General of the, UN, of, of the UN, United Nations 
who died on a peacekeeping on a peace mission to the Congo, and we have a uh, uh, a peace park at the site where where he uh, went down in Ndola, Zambia, and uh, particularly uh, noted that uh, Peggy Grove is one of your exemplars, and I'd like to. Uh, thank Peggy Grove and congratulate her for her support of your initiatives from the very start and everything you've done since. As Lou said, we have um, over 430 or approximately 430 peace parks um, on six of the seven continents. And the thing, Lingwood, that has been so special about each one of them is that they have been dedicated following major summits and conferences um, that we've had around the world as a lasting legacy. So the installation of these peace parks um, called for a wonderful um, ceremony and celebration, and that has launched these peace parks. And just to be a part of the dedication of these peace parks around the world has been something really um, phenomenal. And we are so excited about the great work that you're doing in, in Harrisburg because it joins some very, very significant peace parks around the world, including Bethany Beyond the Jordan, the baptismal site of Jesus by John the Baptist at the Jordan River, uh, Victoria Falls, one of the seven natural wonders of the world, which was dedicated by Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, the founding president of Zambia, and has been named in honor of Dr. Maya Angelou. The United Nations Plaza in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, the Sun River National Park in China, one of the preeminent national parks in China and globally, and also a very significant one in a war-torn country with a great deal of, of conflict in Colombia. So the Peace Park Initiative in Harrisburg sits among titans of peace parks. But as Lou has said, the peace park that, that you have done, my brother, is, is extraordinary because it incorporates the traditional elements of a peace park with the planting of trees and the designating of an appropriate space for reflection. But also what you all have done is you've transformed the blighted and neglected and forgotten space into a beautiful, tranquil space you know, that adds solace to our daily lives. But most significantly, and that's something I'd like to discuss more as, as, as we continue, it provides a significant and major contribution and recognition of African-American history, an important history, not only to Harrisburg, but to this entire nation and the globe. It has really been under Lou's leadership and his ability to bring people together I will give you an example. Our Peace Park at Victoria Falls is very, very special. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we were honored to have uh, the founding president, um, President Kaunda, to assist with, with, the, uh, with the dedication. But not only that, we had the Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization. We had the mayor of Amman, Jordan, to bring olive trees from Jordan that we used in the actual planting and our peace park in China, our peace park in Thailand. When, when we dedicated that peace park, we had dignitaries from throughout South Asia and throughout the world to join us in, in the dedication. Our peace park um, from our very first global summit, uh, which was um, hosted by the King of Jordan and was chaired by Harvey Golub, then chairman of American Express, all joined us for a powerful dedication of the Peace Park at uh, Bethany Beyond the Jordan. I could go on and on and on. It has been absolutely awesome to have these world leaders and, and people who are doing work on the ground, advancing peace through, through tourism from our, our global chapters and our networks, and they're from every sector from academia, from the religious community, uh, from non-governmental organizations, uh, from major corporations, ambassadors and the diplomatic corps coming together as one family, uniting 
around the concept of peace through tourism and dedicating these parks as a tangible and measurable expression of advancing the concept of peace. So we just don't talk about it. We implement initiatives to try to advance the concept. As I spoke earlier, a primary mission is to identify and honor those exemplars of peace. And I can think of no better exemplars to introduce you to at the beginning of this time we spend together than Mr. Momen Bati and Rabbi Ron Muroff. They represent two cultures, two generations, two explorations on the pathway to peace. Gentlemen. Well, um, first of all, thank you for, for having me and for your kind comments. Uh, you know, serving the public, serving the community is a core aspect of our faith. Uh, Islam teaches through the Holy Quran and the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a testament to it that in, in several areas of the Holy Quran, which is our holy book, or the holy book for Muslims, many areas uh, speaks to this, um, about the importance of community service, of serving humanity, of serving our neighbors, and the definition of neighbors, you know, what is that, right? It's not just the people that are next door to you. It's the people that you see in your daily lives. It's the people, uh, you know, even beyond that, that this world is more, more and more connected. And so the definition is always expanding as well. And so we need to see our community, um, not just the people that are immediately around us, but beyond as well. And know that, you know, whatever service that we do, it, it does have an impact. And when it's done with the right intentions and, you know, for the love of humanity, that that's where it can really have the best impact. So our worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masur Ahmad, he has been traveling the world and I'm inspired by his guidance and his leadership. And I'm reminded of the one of the hospitals that he uh, inaugurated. And this was actually in Guatemala, but uh, we were able to watch it live. And uh, I, was, I had many friends that were able to go and visit and volunteer. Um, at that hospital, at that opening. But this is a public hospital that um, we built just out of donations, um, just out of a love for God and for humanity. Um, but then, you know, seeing, seeing his remarks there and around the world, you know, we, we are, we're opening schools, you know, public schools, public hospitals, uh, just with that, uh, that mindset of, you know, how can we, uh, you know, serve others? Um, and in that service, you know, when I see these um, places being opened and, and acted upon and, and my you know, colleagues are volunteering in other countries, you know, taking weeks off, whether they're doctors or just, you know, uh, laborers or, or whatever they are, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and uh, we're all God's creation. And so there's that community aspect in that as well, right? Where our neighbors are not just people right here, but they're around the world. And what can we do to, to serve um, you know, others uh, around the world? So when I see, when I see these events and, and I see um, the people that are being helped, that's, what, that's when I really see um, you know, the core values of my faith uh, you know, being, being acted upon in, in, you know, as, as an action, right? Not just as a belief, but as an action. You know, when we, when we think of peace and um, compassion, I don't believe it's a, it's a passive thing. You know, peace is not something that, okay, you know, I'm not gonna have a quarrel with this person, okay, that's peace. No, that's not peace. Peace is going out and being intentional and, um, you know, act active with it, uh, being conscious, it's a conscious effort and something that we should be striving to do every day and improving upon every day. Our motto in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is love for all, hatred for none. And that's of course rooted in the, in the Islamic teachings uh, through the Quran, through the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through the founder of, of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who we believe to be the promised Messiah. And it's through all these teachings that, you know, 
of love, of, of compassion, of, of peace and, and spreading that, um, that really kind of encourages us and drives us to be at the forefront of that. Um, I'm reminded locally, as far as partnering with other organizations, that recently we had a, a drive, a supplies drive for the Afghanistan refugees, uh, that we were informed that they were arriving in Philadelphia, which is not too far, it's also a neighbor. Yeah. And we wanted to do something. Um, so I, I serve as the regional president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association of the East Region. So uh, comprised of all of New Jersey and Philadelphia, Harrisburg. And you know, as a region, we wanted to do something. We, we happened to have an event there that was coming up uh, shortly after the refugees' uh, arrival. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if all of us just came together and we're, co we're going there anyway, let's bring some, some uh, supplies, clothing. Let's use the strength of our region to, to do something. But we realized we couldn't do it alone because you know, we weren't on the ground there as far as uh, having the uh, relationship or the connection with um, you know, the people that were receiving these refugees uh, at the government level, different things like that. We just know we wanted to help. We wanted to do something. So um, our, our local uh, members there, they were able to connect with uh, and, and partner with an organization that was already working in that space. And they were able to let us know of the items, the specific items that were needed, things like clothing and um, winter coats because winter was approaching, uh, things like baby wipes and diapers because we knew that whole, whole families were coming. But it was through that partnership that we were able to, um, you know, help out more so than, than uh, the amount that we would, would have been able to do on our own. So, you know, we realize and we appreciate that it's through partnerships, it's through that connection and collaboration that we can really move faster and farther and create a bigger impact and do so by having those shared goals and utilizing that shared vision to make a difference. If you could identify those needs that pull on your heart the most, which ones would you work on now? Right. Yeah, there are so many needs uh, in the community and sometimes it feels like it's unending and what can I as an individual do or what can we as, uh, as a local chapter do in, or you know a local place of worship, local congregation, um, you know what, what can we do? Well first I think the most important thing is prayer. You know a lot of people they, they sometimes forget um, that there is a creator to everything and seeking his help who has unlimited uh, you know abilities and limited uh, unlimited power that's really the source of, of, of change that can happen right um, so that you know building that connection but um, more so as far as the action in, in our community you know the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him has said that even a smile is charity you know which a smile anybody can do right it doesn't matter how wealthy or, or um, not wealthy you are or you know if, if, if monetary charity is, is different even a smile is charity and um, sometimes I think about that because of a, a lot of the issues we see are de depression and you know and different things related to that anxiety and, and different things and, and then that affects other things you know peace in the home you know sometimes when we think about peace we think okay world peace and uh, peace in our nation, but really we also have to think about the peace in our home and in our own communities and, and sometimes I feel like that's where we need to focus on because if everybody does that That's going to spread right? You know, and, and we all can we all can play a bigger part uh, as individuals So I think that's something that we should focus on is you know spreading that compassion uh, being compassionate in general um, being kind to everyone and and um, you know, more so, you know, seeing what the needs are, right? Sometimes if, if we just uh, give charity, you know, maybe, maybe that's all that somebody can do, that's fine. But we, have, we also have our time. We can give our time. Who are your role models and those individuals who inspire you? Um, so there's a few people that come to mind when I think about the examples in my life. Obviously, um, religion is a, is a big part of my life. Uh, my faith teaches me about um, serving others and about um, you know building that relationship to my creator and uh, you know to his creation as, as well you know we're, we're all um, God's creation 
and uh, as in one community. And so obviously um, the founder of Islam, prophet of Islam, holy prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, um, inspires me, uh, you know, in, in my daily life. Uh, his, he was the living embodiment of the Holy Quran, our holy book. And uh, his level of compassion and um, just love and spreading the message of peace um, throughout the community, you know, his, his um, uh, his charity and his taking care of uh, the needy and, and um, orphans and you know the people that, that were less fortunate um, has always in inspired me. In the present day, our worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, His Holiness Mirza Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad, um, just just seeing him and I've had the fortune, the good fortune of meeting him a few times as well. Um, and he, he resides in, in, in London and he visited here and he visited uh, Philadelphia. He actually inaugurated the building that we're in, um, you know, several years ago. His leadership and his guidance and his, he is a, um, just a voice for peace, uh, a voice of, um, of service, you know, um, in, in many of his remarks and in what he's done ar around the world, uh, you know, that, that, that continues to inspire me. Now that we are putting together an Exemplars Grove uh, time capsule, what do you think is important to be included? I think um, a time capsule is such an interesting uh, concept. Uh, something that, you know, when we think about time, I think about the fact that we don't have much time in this earth. You know, and um, you know, I reflect on kind of where where we came from and where we're going back to. Um, but I, I'm just reminded that you know, with the importance of of loving our neighbors and loving humanity, that you know, maybe something that could be in that time capsule is is our motto that that we live, which is love for all, hatred for none. How do you, as a man of faith, overcome stereotypes? I think uh, through action, you know, basically, you know, there's talk and then there's action and both are important. And just by, by, by loving others, but then also showing that love, I think is important. You know, people need to see that, people need to feel it. Sometimes they don't know it. Um, stereotypes is some, something that, um, you know, it divides people. And it's, it's always been around, it's not something new, but through effective communication and, and through being intentional with one another and making that conscious effort to, to build on our relationships, uh, I think that can really help overcome stereotypes. I, I, I sometimes think about you know, how, how we are with our actual neighbors that are living right next door. Do, do we know them? Do they know us? And this is the person that is just a few hundred yards, if, if, if less, probably less. And maybe we see them, maybe we just say hi to them, you know, passing by. But do we really know each other? Are we checking in? Are we seeing how they're doing? And um, making that conscious effort because we don't know what people are going through. What is your recipe for raising your children in this divisive time, advancing, teaching them faith and your core values? So my kids are very young right now, uh, eight and six years old. And even at that young age, um, we, try to, we try to teach them about, about the religion and, and uh, the faith traditions and, and the values, the core values. Um, and they ask a lot of questions. And, you know, as parents, you know, my wife and I both, we try to answer uh, all of their questions, but you know, make sure that we're not um, ignoring those questions or letting them know. Oh, worry about it when you're older. You know, this is something you don't need to worry about now. No, they, they need to know. And uh, especially in, in this world that is is constantly changing, um, you know, we try to we, we try to inculcate in them the just just love for for knowledge. And um, you know, love, love for people as well. 
Moment, as always, it is wonderful to be in your presence and we thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your heart, and of course, answering our questions. We've formed relationships. There's a mosque uh, down uh, at uh, Green and, and, uh, and Division Street. Uh, we have a relationship with a mosque in, in Steelton. We've um, developed a relationship with some African-American churches in, in the area, some mixed churches. I think that we can, we can try to stay on our own, all of us, in our own separate you know, places, religiously and otherwise, or we can choose to come together. And, and I, I, you know, like you, I, I'm choosing to, to try to lean in and trying to come together. But even in the, the midst of the darkness, there's always light. And, and sometimes the light comes from within, and sometimes the light comes from, from others who are, who are responding to the tragedy, responding to the loss, in, in generous ways, and generative ways that you never could have imagined. And uh, I hope that um, when I've responded to other losses, when we the congregation have responded, uh, that, that we can be as supportive to others as others have been supportive to us. I, I was once going through a, a personal uh, challenging time, personally challenging time, and somebody said, how can this be a blessing to you? And I, I said, no, no, you're not listening to me. Let me, let me. let me tell you what I was just sharing. And I went through an abbreviated version of what I just, I poured my heart out. I said, no, no, you know, my life is messed up and here's why. And she said, I hear that. I see that. But let me ask you again, how can this be a blessing to you? And just that invitation to look at that same situation, the objective reality had not changed, but the invitation to look at that right. same reality in different ways, like, aha, yes, I'm not ignoring the fact that there's brokenness here. And I wish that it hadn't happened. But now that it has, what what what, what could possibly be? Yes. And and uh, you know, for for us to be supported as a congregation through this difficult time uh, is a blessing that was unanticipated. And like I said, I, I hope you know whether it was after the you know after the tragedy in Charleston when when I helped organize a, a group of clergy to gather together. Or, when we've stood together with our Muslim friends after any number of, you know, attacks, or here in Allison Hill, some members of our community have, have tried to to be supportive. Um, we have so much work to do. I'm just giving a couple of examples, but I just feel like it isn't it isn't me or you. It's you know, not us and them. It's, it's 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 the work. It's the work, right? It's the work. So Linda Schwab is a member of this synagogue, also a member of Bethel Temple. Uh, she established, with the support of her late husband, Maury, a, a fund to promote education about the Holocaust. She herself is a Holocaust survivor, and she's written a, a beautiful memoir about her experiences. And she's established a library at Penn State Harrisburg dedicated to learning about the Holocaust and has spoken publicly. And uh, some years ago, many years ago, she worked uh, to establish uh, an essay writing contest, and uh, it's been guided and supported by Lillian Rappaport, uh, the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And uh, Lillian has done so much work in this community uh, as a Holocaust educator to help raise awareness about the Holocaust and help invite young people and people of all ages really to learn lessons. Um, you know, we talk all the time about learning history so that we don't repeat those mistakes. And yet every generation, there are different different challenges and we can certainly learn from the past. And, uh, and so uh, every year uh, the committee I believe that Lillian continues to staff it, will formulate a question and, uh, and then invite people at different schools to the community at large to participate. Uh, many of the essays are written by young Jewish children, uh, youth, um, but uh, most of the essays, as I recall, are, are written by, you know, students across the community. And, um, and to stand at the Holocaust Monument or to stand at the Jewish Community Center and hear these young people speak with such passion. Um, but some of them have not even had much contact with Jews. Maybe, you know, they, they may have encountered Jews only through their, their reading of Elder Wiesel's Night or, or Anne Frank's Diary. Um, but they speak with such eloquence and such genuine passion. And it gives you hope, you know, that, that maybe the younger generation will help us all learn. I think we human beings, we're, we're natural storytellers. And I think once, once, once we hear somebody's story and it's, complexity, we can't just dismiss them. And, and again, even our, even our seeming rivals or, or political foes. I remember once being at a, being at a rally uh, at the Capitol after Sandy Hook, 
a terrible tragedy in Connecticut when those children were killed. And, and there were people trying to um, lobby the state Senate and state house to pass some legislation that would help prevent you know, assault weapons from getting into the hands of people that shouldn't have them. And that feels like a perf perfectly reasonable thing to me that balances safety and, and the Second Amendment. And there was a counter demonstration encircling us, uh, holding up signs. And I, I left the rally area and I, I went out to the perimeter and I said, you know, forgive me, I, 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 I just want to ask you, what, why are you so opposed to, let's say this? And, and we, we talked face to face and we were standing as close as you and I are together now. And he didn't persuade me and I didn't persuade him. But I, I felt good about the fact that at least for a few minutes we were having a human interaction. I was looking into his eyes, he was looking into my eyes, and I, I lamented that we couldn't, there was no, seemingly no common ground. But, but at least we had an encounter. And I think in this day and age with, you know, people writing such hateful things on Facebook or, you know, in social media or, you know, just, just bypassing each other and saying terrible things about each other, I think if you actually sit together and say, you know, so, so tell me, what, like you asked me, you know, where'd you come from? How did you get here? Um, all of a sudden, it's, it's a living person, whether it's a person alive today or whether it's somebody who unfortunately, sadly, tragically was killed in the Holocaust or anybody who experienced anything. We have to tell their, we have to get to know their names and tell their stories. The artist David Asklon, who worked with a group of survivors from Harrisburg, designed a, a beautiful monument that, that does have, uh, reaching above the barbed wire, uh, some um, part of the structure that's meant to symbolize exactly what you're talking about, that, it, that, that the, the, the Nazis uh, sought to you know, destroy the Jewish people. It was called the final solution. And yet, you know, their uh, courage and their loyalty and their love, um, you know, transcended even though, even, you know, among sadly those who died, that their, their legacy and their lives are more than, are not defined by the Nazis and by the way that they were uh, tortured and, 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 and six million were killed. And to me, that, that, um, that metaphor of, of being beyond uh, the suffering uh, speaks very powerfully in that design. And to think that in a small city in Pennsylvania, albeit the capital city of this you know, beautiful commonwealth, there is a Holocaust monument that is in such a prominent place along the river uh, that has a message and if people do take the time to, to read the inscriptions that, that is, that is um, meant to promote peace and to promote remem a memory and to promote understanding. Uh, I, I hope that it can be a place that people, you know, as they're jogging or riding their bikes or having a picnic or whatever, that they will stop and pause and, and reflect on, on, on the cruelty that we humans can do to each other when we don't uh, stand up for, for, for truth, when we, when we stand idly by when other people are being targeted and attacked. Um, that to me is one of the, you know, the central lessons of the show of the Holocaust that, uh, you know, that, that famous I'm forgetting now uh, who said it, but you know when they came for the Jews, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. When they came, mm. you know, they came for me. Yeah. There was no one else, no no one left to speak. As to, and I think that's that's that was true then, and it's true now. Doctor D. Amore's vision was to create 2,400 peace parks and peace places across the 24 time zones. Our choice here in the capital city, the city, the county, and the capital, Harrisburg, was the four mile long, one block wide riverfront peace park. And our theme, Peace Like a River, was established through the reconstruction, restoration of monuments along the riverfront and the establishment of a peace grove was to create a garden, a place of reflection and remembrance along the four miles. And our exemplar's grove is at Verbeck and Front 
and here to tell you about the Peace Grove is the secretary of our project, Jeb Stewart. We wanted to find a place in Riverfront Park where we could establish the Grove, and we needed an area that was wide enough um, and also an area that hadn't already been occupied by other um, monuments or, or trees or, or other uh, benches, that type of thing. We needed to find an area that would work. And lo and behold, this wonderful area that connects the Firefighters Monument and the Sunken Gardens with the Holocaust Monument just up became available. It was an area where there were a number of dead trees and stumps, and we thought we worked with the city very closely and carefully to have them take the trees down. A whole group of volunteers then came to try to help improve the area by digging up roots and stumps and whatever other, uh, other debris that was there in order to create an area that in fact worked very well for the establishment of the grove. Uh, the challenge was, of course, to get the city to work with us, which they did and were supportive, that we could establish this area for the grove. And also that we worked to create an area that where we were able to get rid of the debris and other um, obstructions in order to smooth it out, break it out, and then start the process of installing the benches, the trees, the landscaping, and other accoutrements that have now transformed this into a wonderful exemplars grove as it is today. We worked with the city uh, arborist and others for that matter to come up with a series of trees that will grow to 100 years um, when none of us, of course, will be around. Um, that had a, a color complement of um, uh, male ginkgos and red maples, each of which bloom a, a nice color in their leaves in terms of having a variety of, uh, of red and gold uh, so that there was some color that was brought into the, into the grove. Um, and they have been planted, of course, and are growing nicely and they've survived and continue to as we continue to enhance the area. No, they're not in a straight line, nor are the benches. They're, they kind of, it's a serpentine and it kind of follows the flow of the river. And that's what we were trying to, to achieve was a flow in the benches, the flow in the trees, the way it's laid out, that emulates the flow of the river, which is right here, which we can see. So it all kind of worked together. There are 12 trees in the grove. The first eight were paid for by Peggy Grove, who's locally known, well known as a philanthropist <laughs> and a supporter of many of our uh, programs in the city that help benefit the city. Uh, she paid for the first eight trees and the remaining four were paid for by the Foundation for Enhancing Communities. Part of this is in honor of the Foundation for Enhancing Communities 100th anniversary. Actually, it's 100 plus one because it would have been last year in 2020, but because of COVID and other issues, we weren't able to gather together to honor that anniversary as well, much as we would like to. So it's happening this year instead. And or, uh, as to who planned and designed the landscaping for the Grove, it was a combination of the city's approval and involvement along with Michael Lehman, who is, has been a volunteer and a helper in this whole project and is a landscaper and knew what to do. And he very uh, adeptly was able to link these benches together uh, through a landscaping plan of mulch, shrubs, flowers, and other plantings, which have really helped to transform this grove into the beautiful spot that it is today. The Peace Promenade is a series that starts at the um, uh, time capsule, the 1860 time capsule um, in Riverfront Park and links a number of monuments and other memorials in Riverfront Park um, that engender the concept of peace. And that's what we try to um, promote through this, this project. Uh, th this grove, of course, continues northward by virtue of linking to the Holocaust Monument, to the Woman's Memorial, a number of blocks up the street, and terminates at the Peace Garden, which is located just north of McClay Street. 
when you sit here, you know, you really do have a sense of peace. And that's what we're trying to promote. The view of the river, the panorama of the river, the mountains beyond, um, the pathway of Riverfront Park. I mean, it's just a tremendous location. Um, and this, quite frankly, it helps to punctuate the beauty of the park and what it means in terms of peace. The Harrisburg Peace Promenade may be the only four mile long peace park in the International Institute's network. The promenade ends in the peace garden created by physicians for social responsibility. Their founder, Dr. John Judson, is one of our nine exemplars of peace. Dr. Judson was called home to glory in this past season and here to share with us his vision and promise of peace and justice is his brilliant wife, Mrs. Anne Marie Judson, interviewed by Mrs. Gloria Martin Roberts. Would you share with us Dr. Judson's vision for the Physicians for Social Responsibility? Thank you for that question. Uh, he was very active on the steering committee of the local chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility. And his concern, as the group's concern, was uh, the preservation of our earth, keeping in mind the current ecological crisis, and also um, peace, the abolishing of nuclear weapons. Those were the two key concerns. I know that he was also very committed to helping um, the citizens of Haiti um, and uh, I uh, worked with Dr. Judson uh, when he was the medical director at Hamilton Health Center and I was the chief operating officer. And when he would take his trips and come back, um, as I was telling you earlier, he, um, he had some very beautiful stories and some very, very heavy, sad stories. And um, did you ever attend uh, w with him when he would go to Haiti? I, I did. Um, he, we first went in 1968 for three months. He was actually a resident at Yale and we had two very young children. And um, I think that's when we both fell in love with Haiti, but we didn't return until 1984 when our children were quite a bit older, stayed for a month mm -hmm. and then he continued to go back many, many times. And we lived in Haiti at Hospital Albert Schweitzer from 1997 until 1999. So that was a very special uh, and significant time in our lives. Wow. wow, I didn't realize you lived there. That is just wonderful. And that kind of leads me into my next question. If you would tell us about his personal guiding light for responsible uh, citizenship? I think he really believed that we had a mission, and he certainly believed this, to make the world a better place, to be actively involved, and to lead as a servant. He had a model of servant leadership. He certainly did, and I think that's why he and I got along so well. Uh, it's because I, I have that, that same passion uh, for servant leadership, and he certainly did demonstrate that throughout his life. Um, how did the beautiful Peace Garden on the riverfront in the city of Harrisburg come to be? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. It was actually inspired by um, a trip, <clears throat> excuse me, to Hiroshima 
that Dr. Jim Jones and his wife took back in, I believe it was 1987 or 88. They attended this international meeting of the Physicians for Social Responsibility and Dr. Jones came back and just had a vision and a dream that he needed to do something concrete for peace. And the Peace Garden was actually established by the local chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility and the city of Harrisburg in 1990. And it continues to this day to beautify our, our city. <clears throat> It certainly does. It's beautiful there. It's a beautiful place to visit. And um, so how did the installation of public art um, along the um, landscape advance your work and your cause? Well, I think it, it beautifies the environment. Um, it educates people. We're all working for the same things. We're working peace globally, peace locally. And um, it serves to inspire and educate people. And, and I think the Peace Garden unites people. When I've been there working, people walk by, bike by, and they're happy. They're, they're just transformed by the beauty. I, the I agree. So with that said, um, can you share with us your incredible work? for peace and justice. Don't leave too much out now. We really want to hear it. <laughs> well, um, I have been a member for many years of an international Catholic peace group called Pax Christi, which means peace of Christ. And uh, in the Harrisburg area, we started in the year 2000 and we have an interfaith walking way of the cross every year on Good Friday. Okay. Um, and the other event that we try to do is candles on the water to commemorate the bombing of the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that's usually held in early August. I also initiated a vigil in 2004 until 2013 that was called Women in Black. And Women in Black actually is an international women's peace group um, for justice and against war. And when the Iraq war and then the Afghanistan war started, a group of Harrisburg citizens vigiled every week on the corner of um, Front and Market at the courthouse. Right, right. We received a lot of um, verbal insults and expletives, but as the war went on, there were more, there was more agreement with what we were doing. And we stood in silence. We didn't engage in conversation and we wore black as a sign of mourning for the victims of war and violence. And uh, actually this group, we stopped in 2013, but there are still vigils around the world. Tell us what message would you send to young leaders and change agents today who are taking up the important work of peace and equity and justice? I love that question. <laughs> I would say to persevere, of course, we all grow weary, yes. but yes. keep on not to expect to see quick changes and maybe not even changes in our lifetime, mm -hmm. um, and, but to join and collaborate with other groups and kindred spirits. And I have a quote that someone gave me. It hangs above my desk. It's a quote by Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It says, almost anything you do will seem insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. So that helps me mm -hmm. uh, to keep on going. 
Is there a particular organization or organizations that you would encourage young people to uh, participate in that would help um, to advance your work and the uh, work of Dr. Judson? I, I would encourage young people to look at Rotary. Rotary is an international service organization, very active in Harrisburg and um, around the world. And they get involved with projects right here and also overseas. And it's, um, it's just, a, my husband was very active in it have weekly meetings um, but they're tailored to whatever you want if you want a noon meeting at the Hilton you can go there if you want a, a five five o'clock meeting at um, the Keystone Club meets at a brewery you can do that oh, okay, oh, okay. Uh, each rotary group has its own personality its own time i think there's a very early breakfast meeting uh -huh, uh -huh. but it's it's a wonderful way to learn about the community and i know next week uh chief carter mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is speaking at the harrisburg rotary at noon so you learn a lot and you network and it's just a great organization that's wonderful. Do they have a um, a young people's uh, subgroup of Rotary, or uh, would they uh, get seek membership uh, to just the regular Rotary and learn the process that way? Well, there are uh, Rotary um, youth groups, and I think some people have the misconception that Rotary is a group of old white men. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> that it is no longer. I'm happy to say there's a lot more diversity, and um, of course that just makes it all the better. Um, but and some of the groups have a much younger age group coming. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll just need to Google Rotary and try out some meetings. Well, I'm happy you're saying that. I, I know I'm probably aging myself, but um, I do remember at a, a, a time when only men attended the, the, the Rotary and women were not permitted. And so I, I really do remember uh, when that ice was finally broken. And, it, and uh, so you're right, they do a lot of good things and they do a lot of good things in the community. So that's very, very good advice for, for the young people. And I want to sincerely thank you for taking time out today um, to chat with me and uh, to tell you how valuable uh, you and Dr. Judson are to our community and have been to our community and the commitment and sincerity that you have both shown. Um, I want to personally thank you for lending Dr. Judson to our community. Um, I, you know, every time um, a person is away doing, when they're, you're a servant leader and you're away, you, you take time away from your family. And it, it really is a commitment. Um, and he certainly demonstrated that and so do you. So I thank you. May God continue to bless you. And I hope I see you soon in person. There is a famous poem which ends in the lines, each one teach one, each one bring one back into the sun. This could have been the banner for our next exemplar, Dr. George Love, here to share with us his visions on public education are his wife and his daughter, interviewed by Dr. Jean Corey of Messiah University. Hi, I'm Jean Corey, and I'm a recently retired professor from Messiah University. Um, I directed the Center for Public Humanities for several years, and through my work there, had the pleasure of working 
with Linwood Sloan on the Commonwealth Monument Project, a gathering at the crossroads, and the exemplars. And Linwood asked if I would interview Mrs. Hetty Love and her daughter, Karen Love. Um, and Hetty is the wife of Dr. George Love, who is one of the exemplars um, from the Exemplar Grove. And actually, I, I was delighted because I've been friends with them for a long time. I, uh, the first Sunday we moved to Harrisburg, we went to St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And the first Sunday we went to St. Paul's Episcopal Church, I met the Loves. And it has been a long, wonderful relationship. And I've been a fan of Dr. George Love and Mrs. Hetty Love for a long time. And um, I, I've especially been grateful that my children have been able to learn from the history and their commitment to social justice. That has been just such a, um, a wonderful thing for our family. The Union of Black Episcopalians took on this project to find a way to honor my father and my mother by establishing a scholarship that would reward a student who's going into education. Anyone who knows knew my father or knows my father or did know my father knew that he loved to teach. He was a consummate educator who was always trying to encourage the next generation to do what was uh, in their best interest, to follow their passions, to, to really uh, live their best life but in a way that was supportive of community service. And so as he grew into his roles, he also um, encouraged my mother and me to go into education and to find ways to help other children and other people as well. And so the Love Gala was the culmination of many years of planning, but never really having the opportunity to have everything come together. And on September 19th, the most beautiful day of the year, <laughs> we were able to host the Love Gala that raised enough money for us to get started on a scholarship to reward students of color who will go into the field of education. My husband often developed things in the church to help students. We had an after-school program where children could come and get help with their homework, and he never did anything without dragging his wife into it. <laughs> so I got an education along with the children on how to do things publicly, but he was a person who, he, he, he was invited to go to church to teach before he even got all this uh, publicity. So I often wondered how did the people who did that program know that he would be a good teacher for them? And of course, as always, once we got there, they wanted to know, could not teach too? So, I taught in a local school and while he was in one of the bigger schools that the government sponsored. He went Science, to the right? University of Pennsylvania and he was studying to be a doctor. And somehow or other, I think I influenced him that that wasn't a good idea for him because I felt he would be away from home. At those days, doctors were on call and if somebody was gonna have a baby, he'd be called out of the house and they'd be gone all night. And I wasn't happy with that being a, a new wife. <laughs> so I conned him into thinking maybe something else was better. And he went into uh, met science. science. He went into science. And he got his regular degree and his doctorate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And, and, and he taught in Philadelphia. He oh, yeah. taught in Philadelphia. He loved teaching science. He graduated from Central High School, which was an all boys, all academic school, even when he was a child. And so he graduated one of six African Americans from that school and then came to teach in, her, in Philadelphia. He taught at Gratz High School for many years. Um, and then I think we went to Turkey and when he came back, he went to Central and was able to teach the gifted and high achieving science students that were in attendance at Central and his students loved him. They really got so much out of that experience. And his students in Turkey did too. They did not want him to leave oh, when bet. it was time for us to come back to the United States. And Mrs. Love, you taught in Turkey too, right? Yes, as I say, 
they asked any wife who had a degree could be expected to teach. And so I taught in the local school there. And it was a strain on me because I didn't go there preparing to do anything but be a housewife. And, uh, <laughs> but you certainly had the credentials to teach. Don't you want to say something about that? Well, yes, as I said, <laughs> I, I did graduate from Fisk University as a math teacher. And then I went on to the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, where I studied to be an MBA. However, at that time, there were no black women in the program, but uh, they accepted me. And so when I got there and found out that I was going to be the only black and the only woman in all my classes, I was a little disturbed. But then I met my husband before classes began, and he distracted my attention and kept me busy when I wasn't in class. So I didn't really feel too badly about not being able to communicate with my classmates. And of course, shortly thereafter, we got married. And we were married for 66 years before he died. Can you tell us about the, your actual meeting? What did he say to you the first oh. time you met on the campus? <laughs> well, my mother was very protective, and I was never allowed to go anywhere without an out escort. When I was going to Fisk, my mother found a friend whose daughter was going to that college and encouraged her to let me ride on the train with her because during those times of segregation, we were, you know, a little afraid for our children. But they were. I didn't know anything about the fear because everywhere I went, my mother had taken me and come back and picked me up. And so I had no idea of how things actually were in the world. And of course, when I got ready to go to the University of Pennsylvania, my mother got my brother to take time off from his job. He was five years older and uh, go with me to the University of Pennsylvania. And as we were walking on campus, my brother stopped this young man and said to him, how can we find the registrar's office? And he said, my name is Charles Simmons. This is my sister, Miss Simmons. Being from the South, you don't give up people's first names without their permission. So the young man said, oh, good to see you. My name is George Love, so I can show you where the... So the next day or two, he saw me talking to some of the other people on campus, and he yelled out to me, how's your husband? And I said, I have no husband. Yes, you do. I met your husband. And so when I said, no, that was my brother, and he felt satisfied, he pulled out his book and said, give me your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> well, that time, after that, I had no obligation and no worry about how I was going to spend my free time. <laughs> <laughs> he filled it for you. Fine, Absolutely. Huh? <laughs> so it was after I graduated, and uh, he said to me, you're going to write me every day while you're home. I said, I'm probably never going to see you again. I mean, you live in Philadelphia and I live in Florida. There's no chance of us meeting again. And by Christmas time, we had had enough conversation over the phone that one of the phone calls said to me, let's plan for a marriage in June. Not will you marry me, but let's plan. <laughs> <laughs> he so, had a plan always, didn't yes, he? Yes, <laughs> he did. <laughs> so, of course. He and his mother came to Florida. His father didn't think it was a good idea for him to you know, get married so young and whatever. But uh, anyway, his father came to like me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did they think of you being the first African-American woman to graduate with her MBA? Did, they, did well, that intimidate them? No. Um, black people are very adjustable. They accept you for who you are. Some people are better than others, you know. And, so they didn't know anything about the university and what was going on there. And I didn't make any complaints among the people I knew. So that uh, there was, I was really surprised when some years later somebody felt that was important, that I was the first. I had been in the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority for 75 years, and they were honoring me for that. And they had Karen to tell my life story. And when she told about having been at the University of Pennsylvania, as soon as the ceremony was over, a young woman came up to me and said, is it really true? What year did you graduate? And I told her, she says, oh, I'll have to talk to you. So she lived in New York. Her name was Lana Woods. And from that point on, she and I have become great friends. And she's been to visit me. I've been to visit her. And she has seen to it that the university recognized me 
as the first African American. So. And she earned her degree in 1947. And before that time, they had no record of who would have been the first. And so with Lana's help, she was able to research what she could find. And as far as they know, she is the first uh, both male or female to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania. So it has been a, an amazing roller coaster ride because um, now my mother is in her 90s, about to celebrate her 99th birthday. And all of this recognition came since 2016. So you know, in the last five years, um, she's become the public face <laughs> in a lot of places that she would never have thought. And so just to let you know, life continues and can continue to be exciting no matter what stage of life you're in. If you embrace the, the life and lead a life of service and love and support, um, you will find a place where people will come to love and support you. There can be no peace without progress. And the great philosopher, educator, engineer of civil rights, and 19th century abolitionist, Martin Delaney says that every people have to be the architects of their own destiny. An architect of civil rights, an exemplar of our peace promenade, is the Honorable Homer Floyd. We'd like to introduce Mr. Floyd to you, interviewed by Ruby Dodd. Hi, my name is Ruby Dobb, and I am a member of the African American Monument located in Dauphin County in downtown Harrisburg on the Irvis uh, lawn. And I am here today uh, to interview the Honorable, the Exemplar, Homer Floyd. You have such a robust civil rights career as, ex as Exemplar. What do you want your legacy to be? Um, a hard worker. Um, I, I think that I, I, oh, I overcame some things that um, were, were embarrassing uh, to uh, myself and others. Hmm. But for example, I was born and, and raised to the fourth grade in uh, Wetumpka, Alabama. I finished my um, uh, schooling uh, in Maslin, um, uh, uh, and that's when I was able to get go to the right place at the right time to get a scholarship uh, to go to college. Wow. Otherwise, I never would have made it. Wow. Uh, so I, I I cherish that as as being a very important uh, in my life uh, now. I can't, I can tell you very, very much. I have been called a nigger so many times. Sometimes I thought my name was in it. Wow. I wow. mean, that, that, that was, that was early. Uh, that was early. I remember one experience when, um, when um, my mother uh, who moved to Massillon, Ohio, um, but she, she was, took us there for a visit and uh, we went through uh, Washington, D.C. And we, the train from Cleveland to D.C. was okay, no problem. When we got to D.C., the next stop was Atlanta, Georgia. They deintegrated. Oh. Rather than they, they um, put all the blacks in one rock car, the whites in a, another, mm -hmm. and um, that I think was a troubling experience. They didn't. We were so crowded until my, my sister and I 
didn't have a didn't have a place to sit or or um, uh, move around. Wow. So we slept on the on the floor wow. of the uh, of the train at the feet of some some of the. Uh, so so uh, those kinds of experiences will help build termination to see if you can write write that wrong. This university, but this is Kansas State, in which um, we, I, as a, the director of the Civil Rights Agency there, we paid a, paid a visit to Kansas State and to ch talk with the chancellor because of the lack of minority uh, participation in the school, either as uh, teachers or uh, students. And uh, so part of, of that uh, activity, we were able to get a promise from the uh, chancellor that he, he was going to make some special efforts uh, to see if he can change the picture that, uh, the, that he has there. Um, I got a call from him uh, a month or so later, and it was uh, his calling me to say that they had invited uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, to the university, and he wanted me uh, to come. Um, and that was a, a kind of a pleasant experience because many of the students, uh, uh, those students who were African American, were, were very much interested in what we were doing. And so therefore, uh, the writing of Dr. King was timely. Um, now, I did not um, remember much about the activity until later. I guess uh, we're talking about this was the same year Dr. King was assassinated. As a matter of fact, a month and a half, I think, uh, he was assassinated. Um, I did not. Uh, run into him in terms of that uh, setting. Um, it was uh, about f four years, five, maybe five years uh, from now, backward. Um, and I found that uh, they wanted me to come and uh, at the university and um, uh, uh, help them celebrate. When I got there, I was also shown pictures of what he had in his pocket, Dr. King, when he was assassinated. And one of the name on, on the uh, tablet uh, was Homer, Flo Homer C. Floyd. And uh, the uh, university called me and flew me back and they had a big thing about it. Uh, well, it, it, it was 67 when, when the event took place, meaning uh, uh, the, the uh, inviting me to, or us drop, dropping in on me, we really dropped him in on me. That was uh, a year later then uh, they, they invited us. And what year were you in college? I was in college from uh, 1955 uh, to 1960. So I have to tell you, okay. you know, um, I did some reading about you during that period of time and I was blown away because you and I sit in the same meetings, NAACP and uh, various organizations and there's some background I didn't know about you and you're, besides being an All-American um, and moving on to college where you experience some um, some racial injustices. Sure. Um, specifically, if you could talk about um, your teammates and the differences that maybe they were treated versus how you may have been treated, um, hotels, restaurants, and how, what happened during that period of time? Um, in terms of, of uh, if I go uh, say uh, the college experience, um, the, we were in the uh, the football. We were in the 
Big Eight at that period oh, of time. Wow. In Merton, Missouri, uh, which is Southern School. Uh, we had Texas Christian, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Um, those, uh, we've, I had a number of experiences. I had good experiences, but I had some, uh, you know, difficult ones too. So uh, one of the accomplishments or one of the good experiences was the fact that you were named, were you the first African-American uh, co-captain mm -hmm. on your, your team? That, yes. that was huge. How, how did you feel That's about cool. that? It, it was certainly an honor. It was, and it, but because of, there were two of us that provided leadership to the, uh, to the team mm -hmm. that was recognizable at times. Uh, and it's in that context that uh, the team and the coach uh, all voted me to serve as a, one of the captains. Wow. Yeah. And that says a lot. Yeah. Um, because but, apparently some of the teammates never even played with an African American before. Is that true? Uh, there were individuals on my team uh, was, they, they were very, I think, standoffish initially, but uh, by the time um, I left uh, for, and graduated, uh, they were, uh, they voted me a captain and, uh, and all kind of accolades. And I, they've even been, one uh, group, uh, we, uh, since I, I guess uh, uh, four years ago, uh, they invited me back to the university. Wow. And uh, recognized you, I read that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. For, firstly, I, I think that, that Harrisburg has, has grown some, um, when, when I first came, um, we cited and went to the court and wanted uh, in school desegregation. And um, we, we don't have, it, now we don't have a, a school that, um, you, you know, you can't go to because of your race. Right. So uh, to, uh, that's an uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, employment uh, is an area where um, I think we've made some improvement. I know we've made some improvement because it, there are very few African Americans in any position in, in uh, KU, not in uh, uh, the city here. City, yes. School, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, the, the school, the d district was de, jure, de, de, de facto segregation. That you know, that's that's when uh, it's your your neighborhood uh, schools. Uh, if they were African American or part African American, that would have been a de facto. If the policy of the school of the d district is no matter where you. Uh, want to go, you go into the African American black school. For example, um, Steelton uh, was many of the uh, students in, in the early days, and that my secretary was one of them, was um, there was an elementary school in which all the blacks uh, were assigned to. And um, the, we filed a complaint against uh, the district okay. uh, on on that basis. We got that resolved. Wow. Uh, now it's a neighborhood school as opposed to one that they show you all in the same. Right. Um, and we, here in Pennsylvania, there were 17 school districts that we cited uh, at the same time for de facto set, uh, not say de facto, but de jure segregation, uh, which was 
we caught hell for it. Wow, uh, I bet. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think that looking in, in we initiated, um, I think, uh, eight, uh, 70 some complaints in the state, including Harrisburg. Um, so uh, about their employment. Uh, so we've done those things to get the ball rolling. Uh, now we caught heck for it. Uh, the legislature induced a bill to abolish the agency. Yeah. Uh, we fought that back. Um, but um, it, Harrisburg is a better place in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. But we have so far, uh, you know, uh, to go in order to do what needs to be done in order to uh, have an effective community. When, when I look at what, what we've been going through, we thought we had made substantial progress. Mm -hmm. We thought we had uh, uh, beaten down some of the Jim Crow stuff. We did. That, we did. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, things started happening, mm -hmm. and we're back where, in, ter in terms of, of where we want to go and, and, and opportunities, um, it's, wow. it's, it's two steps forward and through. Two steps back. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so that's kind of the way I see it. Um, but part of it is we, we all have to stand up and do something. And we blame we blame white folks, and we white folks they're, they're also trying to live their life and get whatever they can get out of it. Uh, but yet, um, we we have to fight that, and we have to uh, and we have to. I think wherever it sticks its head, we have gotta fight it. We gotta. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that we might have some things that we need to clean up. I would love to know, and this is my question, uh, are there, can you give me one or two gems that you, of wisdom, that you would want uh, to pass on, uh, that you, you've learned and experienced through your lifetime? Um, well, first of all, let, let me say that when you mentioned your experience, while I've experienced a lot of uh, discrimination and segregation uh, in my, uh, my time, um, I was also free to do some things to help some people in the process. And, uh, Absolutely. 41 Ta years of doing that. Yeah. <laughs> taking, uh, I was 41 years in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least you all, you, you uh, show a few f footprints someplace along the way. Mm -hmm. And I, while I walk, I came here as an outsider, I do think that uh, I worked hard enough to be considered an insider. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the things that we accomplished. I would say that, first of all, your education is most important to you. And while we fight discrimination and so forth, it is, it is important that you don't disrupt your life so that you can't overcome uh, some some people have gone to jail and, and so forth. That ought to be a last resort. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also uh, we also have a little black on black uh, yes. that uh, it seems to me that we need to clean up. Mm -hmm. uh, fighting each other for nothing. Killing uh, each other. Uh, killing each other. Uh, th th that's a uh, that's hard to that's hard to take mm -hmm. and hard to accept mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, 
as a civil rights issue. Right, we need to come together as a community. Um, that's the only way we're gonna achieve, right? Right, absolutely. Have you ever considered the statue of blind justice? Can justice truly be blind? We had the opportunity to sit down with our next honoree, Judge Jean Turgeon, at the Dolphin County Library System's McCormick Library to speak about justice for all. We had the opportunity to ask Dr. Jean Turgeon, our next exemplar of peace about blind justice at the McCormick Library, the Dolphin County Library System's site for the new Thomas Chester Research Center. Dr. Turgeon is interviewed by Mr. Eric Jackson, who portrays Thomas Morris Chester in the Pennsylvania Past Players. Uh, my name is Janine Turgeon. I was a judge for 30 years and a lawyer uh, before that, but uh, live here in Harrisburg with my family. As a startup question, tell us what was the spark that led you to the robe and the bench? Well, I very much enjoyed uh, practicing law, but I saw that there was one challenge we had in Dauphin County, and that is uh, traditionally, uh, well, since 1785, we've only been uh, electing white men, and uh, believe it or not, only two Democrats had ever been elected to the bench in over 200 years. And traditionally, those who became judge had been like a prior uh, party leader or prior district attorney. And as a practicing lawyer who represented real people and small businesses, I just felt it was really important to have someone on the bench who had actually practiced law and represented individuals and families and small businesses. And so that's the type of person I wanted to see elected judge. And uh, we tried to get a lot of people to run. And even today, as then, it's very difficult to get anybody to leave their law practice, to run a campaign, to run for judge. And finally, everybody said, would you quit asking people to run for judge? You run, you're exactly what we need on the bench. So talked to my family about it at the Thanksgiving dinner table as I was nursing my latest little baby, and uh, we decided that I would make a run for it. I was very, very fortunate uh, to be able to obtain an internship with the Honorable Kaylee Royervis. As you know, he was the first uh, black African-American to be speaker of a state house of representatives. Uh, he came from an average family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, ran for office, got reelected, but he established himself among all the House members as a leader. Not just the title, but as a man. He was an educator, he was an activist, although he uh, was not loud or braggadocious. He was what we call a statesman. He was just an incredible man, an incredible human being, and it was such an honor to be able to obtain that internship, and then working with him and his staff all summer was one of the most rewarding experiences that a young person could ever have, so I really treasure those memories. Who would you consider amongst the exemplars of justice today? Who, who would they be? Well, we all have challenges with uh, different courts today. As you know, often on the front pages of our newspapers, local, national, and worldwide, is what has the court done today with a policy? And frequently, we need society to be a little more just in order to get justices from some of our 
courts, and sometimes we need our courts to impose justice to pull society along. So sometimes what we want are individuals who represent justice as viewed from our society. Other times, as we know during the civil rights era, what we needed were justices to help the country and society come along a little bit. Uh, perhaps being a woman, I'm prejudiced, but I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of our greatest recent uh, justices. Sandra Day O'Connor, everyone thought she was going to narrowly interpret the law, having been appointed by the president uh, that she was. But as we know throughout her life, she evolved. She was willing to have an open mind and make uh, decisions that people never expected her to make. Uh, so I would say, although she's deceased, I would put uh, Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg uh, in that area as far as justice, but other people who have tried to achieve justice in this country, uh, Colin Powell. I worked closely with Colin Powell and the organization America's Promise, which was devoted to helping youth, give youth their five, five promises that we need to give youth uh, today, which is a healthy start, uh, a mentor, someone who they can trust and trusts them, a, health, a healthy start, safe places uh, to be, and teach them how to give back to the community. Uh, and those issues all go to justice uh, because our young people don't necessarily have an equal starting point. And what is your definition of liberty and justice for all? Justitia, the Greek goddess Justitia that you frequently see on courthouse walls or in law books, uh, you will see her holding the scales of justice with blindfolds over her eyes. And that does not mean that she's blind. <laughs> it means that she is blind to prejudices. So when you would appear in front of me, if I were the Greek goddess Justitia, uh, I would not know your gender. I would not know your race. I would not know your ethnicity. I would not know your appearance. You know, whether you're wearing jewelry from Tiffany's or you're wearing, wearing a sweatshirt, I would not know any of those things. I would decide your case solely based on what was presented to me, the facts and the law. So that's what justice is supposed to be. And that is the ideal. Unfortunately, it does not happen in some cases. Some cases it does happen, but people don't understand what has happened. So another process of justice is not just to do justice, but to explain justice and explain why there has been a certain result. I know that there would be people in my courtroom as well who would feel that they did not get a fair shake. And finally, Judge Turgeon, what would you like to put into the time capsule for the future generations to discover? Well, to put into a time capsule for future generations, we have to decide, do we want to put something in there that we hope is sustained in the future? Or do we want to put things in there that we hope will be gone? Uh, what I would love to put in the time capsule uh, would be uh, a picture of all of the signs that people now have in their yards. Uh, one has to do with, uh, you know, treating somebody uh, with uh, love and respect despite their religion, despite their ethnicity. Uh, they're all, it's all in different languages as we all are. The anti-immigration issue is uh, hot on the, uh, the front page of every paper. I would like to take a time capsule of that yard sign and say, I hope this is not needed 50 years from now. I admit it, I'm a Trekkie. And everyone knows that when you go off to explore, you need a mothership. The mothership 
for the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism's Harrisburg Peace Promenade is the foundation for enhancing communities. Therefore, it is a privilege to introduce to you the CEO of TFECT, Miss Janice Black, who was interviewed by our own Jeb Stewart. My name is Janice Black and I am president and CEO of the Foundation for Enhancing Communities. The Foundation for Enhancing Communities, or TFEC, as we're commonly known, is the fiscal sponsor for the IIPT Harrisburg Promenade project. It is not its own nonprofit, and coming to us enabled the group to function as a nonprofit and raise money that gave their donors a tax, a tax benefit uh, with the IRS. So it enabled them to do that. And also we took care of receiving all the money, uh, reconciling it, and then they submitted all the bills to us. We paid them all. So we are essentially their backroom service group, um, as well as giving them the ability to function as a nonprofit organization. We were very honored to be part of this because we, we are so very interested in the history of Harrisburg and hearing about the history of the old eighth ward and being part of all that went into this project was just, it was glorifying for us. We were just so pleased to be part of it. Yes. And we were able to give a contribution of 25,000 towards that um, project, which made us very pleased to be able to really help pay for part of it, as well as be the project a fiscal sponsor. Uh, the Foundation for Enhancing Communities uh, was 100 years old in 2020, as we were started by Donald McCormick, who was the president of Dolphin Deposit Bank in 1920. And he, through the Chamber of Commerce, decided uh, that we really should have a community foundation in this area. So he put up the money in his will. And um, after he passed away, uh, his sisters had the ability to use the funds until their deaths. And then it came to us and we were able to start the foundation in 1920. Well, we get many, many potential projects through our doors, um, and we have to weigh each one of them carefully to make sure that they really are charitable, to make sure that they are doing something worthwhile. Um, and when we heard of, of this one, when you brought this one to us, um, we knew it was going to be an exceptional project. Um, and again, we really wanted to be part of getting the word out about the old Eighth Ward story because so many people in Harrisburg know nothing about it. It's amazing to me that people don't know about that and, and what had to happen before the, our capital, the back of the capital was built and how those people had to be um, evacuated, if you will, <laughs> by government imminent, uh, what is it, imminent domain. Eminent domain. Um, and so they uh, all had to give up their homes. They had to go somewhere else. I have no idea if they got much money for their homes. Um, and they made the best of it and had to relocate. And some of the folks that I've spoken to who are family members of those who had to leave, the conversations are really, really worthwhile. And it makes me just so much more tuned in to Harrisburg. I love Harrisburg and it's just interesting to know, if you will, the sadness of all the things that have happened to the, our, our African-American community in Harrisburg. So this helps us to hold it up and have people be more aware of it. The then, now, and forever are, it's our way of defining our past, our present, and our future. Um, and I brought you the annual reports because uh, we named those then, now, and forever, which demonstrate in depth um, our history and where we are now and hopefully where we're going. This one is gonna be forever that's gonna come out. So um, we wanted to talk about our life in that way, then, now, and forever. An exemplar of peace and public service is an individual who really works diligently um, to provide um, great work in the community. This is vital because if we don't do this, it is going to be forgotten. And I think it will just raise the ire of folks who are upset about things. We all need to work together to try to make this a better place. And I think by recognizing people and helping them to be known for the work that they did and helping to raise others up, like um, the Speaker of the House, Irvis, the fact that it's on 
the lawn of the Irvis part of the Capitol building. It's wonderful and it's just such a fabulous um, opportunity for us to be part of that. One of the paramount goals of the IIPT Peace Parks Network is to consider the climate for the commemoration of those who have been forgotten. We chose great African-American orators of the 19th century. We chose the spot where Frederick Douglass spoke on the power of the franchise. We chose the anniversaries of the 15th and the 19th Amendment, and we chose the valued, now vanished, Old Eighth Ward as the site. Now the Eighth Ward is gone. There's not a brick or a mortar of it, but the families of those who live there continue the struggle of peace and progress. And here to tell you about one of those great architects of peace and progress is Miss Yvonne Hollins and her niece, Joy Washington, are descendants of the great civil rights engineer, Maude Coleman, whose name is honored on the pedestal at the monument site. Welcome, ladies. Joy, since you asked me questions about our relative Maud Coleman, I pulled a lot of information that I wanted to share with you. So, and Maud was born in 1883 and she passed in 1953. And that's when I was only three years old. So I didn't know her that, that well. But we have a cousin, Gail uh, Quarles, Gail Jackson Quarles, who lives in LA. And she has a lot of information regarding Maud. So I thought I'd just bring some information to share with you because it's important that our history is shared with all of our uh, descendants, our younger generation, so that they can pass it on to our next generation and so forth, so that her legacy, our legacy, will continue forever. What I found interesting um, in the history of Aunt Ma was that not only did she live in the eighth floor, but she also lived in the seventh floor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very interesting to know that not only one ward was affected, but two. Two were affected. Well, what had happened is that they lived in the eighth ward and it was a very, very prominent um, area. And um, they were thriving and doing extremely well. But then there was an unfortunate incident where the Capitol burned. And so they decided that they wanted to have that land, the eighth ward, in order to rebuild the Capitol. And um, Maud wrote a, a letter to the governor, Governor Duff, and said, please do not force us out of our homes. And he never responded to it. He had his assistant respond to it. And basically it was, the answer was no. So they did what we consider today eminent domain. They just went in and took the, took the land. So then that probably forced her into the seventh ward and that was in, on Boat Street. How are you related to Mrs. Maud V. Coleman? Maud Coleman is the aunt or sister of my grandmother, Helen T. Ross. So the Ross side of the family is how we are related to Maud. We have individuals who are doing lots of research and they're finding one date that she was born and another date that she was born. And it was because of the census that they had. And when they took the census, sometimes what they wrote down was not accurate. So we call her Aunt Maud. Where did she live in the old eighth ward? She lived at 129 Short Street. And if you look at this, you'll see that Short Street is here. And she lived at 129. And then she also lived on Bow Street at 641 Bows. What was Aunt Maud's contribution to women in Harrisburg? Her contribution to women in Harrisburg and throughout the state and also in other states was to make sure that there was equity 
and diversity and that they had equal rights. Um, she did everything that she could possibly do to help them with equal employment um, and that they were considered and respected as responsible individuals. As well, her legacy in Central Pennsylvania. Her legacy in Pen Central Pennsylvania and we were researching some of this and the uh, Maud Squad from Messiah College who have been actually resource, researching Maud Coleman, that has been their emphasis the whole time, is, is actually researching Maud. And they did discover that she was a co-founder of the Phyllis Wheatley. Why? The YWCA here in Harrisburg. And yet I went to the Harrisburg YWCA to see if I could find anything, any archives. And they said they didn't know anything about that, that they had heard about it, but they didn't have. And yet the Maud Squad was able to find a lot of the research in Lancaster because Lancaster. she started a Y in Lancaster. She also started one in Reading. So you know how that is. Right. You're never really accepted in your own home. In your own home. <laughs> but that's why it's important for us to continue to share her story and other stories to our descendants so that they know the history. You never know where you're how how you're going somewhere until you know from whence you've come. Right. So you need to know and to have that information and it's a wealth of information. And we are a brilliant, beautiful people. Agree. What is the Maud Coleman Stewardship Fund? The Maud Coleman Stewardship Fund, I was blessed um, in knowing Phyllis Bennett. And she was working with uh, Linwood and Gloria Martin Roberts and Kelly Summerford and Bette Davis. And she said, you know, you should be on this committee. And I said, okay, I think I'd enjoy that. Little did I know that when I joined it was discovered when we actually dedicated this particular podium that Maud Coleman was on there and Maud Coleman is, I'm a descendant of Maud Coleman. It was just amazing. So then we decided that in order to make sure that this, this beautiful, beautiful statue um, situation here, this monument was going to be well kept and so they needed funding in order to do that. So that's when I contacted our family members and said, this is what we need to do. This is what the amount of money they need is $2,500. So we all took out of our personal pockets and provided that money. And then you went beyond when you asked your place of employment to support that and that's how we were able to start that. So we want to continue to build on that because what happens is that all of these statues who are here need to continue to be maintained and beautified. The area needs to be maintained. I come down every Sunday and I sweep to make sure that it's clean, that the leaves are out. You've come down with your leaf blower once all the leaves are down because sweeping all those leaves yes, just wouldn't. So I just, I love <laughs> you for that, that you come and you do that. And our purpose is to continuously replenish that fund. And we're asking all descendants, there's over 100 names on here, mm -hmm. that the descendants of the individuals of these 100 names would also step forward and start to donate the funds in order to maintain this. This is some, this is the first statue or monument, first monument, African-American monument on the Pennsylvania state grounds, the very first. Remarkable. So we have a responsibility, which is to maintain it. Whatever it takes, we will maintain it. If it means that we need to come down here every Saturday and wipe it, then that's what we'll do. But we do have individuals who have been very, very helpful, who were actually the artists that designed, that actually created the monument and the statues. And they've been just exceptional and coming in and doing what needs to be done to maintain them. Okay. So we need individuals. So those of you who are, who are looking at this, please, at any donation is going to be very beneficial. And we, if you go on to the website, you will see exactly where to send that donation. So we do need those donations. 
We spoke briefly about the Mod Squad. Um, as a descendant, I'm blessed and honored. Is there anything you would like to see the younger generation get involved in? The younger generation needs to step up and take their place. They were, come beside us right now, see what we are doing and start to fill in those areas so that when there is a void that you are able to step up and carry on and to make and we're get we're not getting any younger although i'm not getting any older i just watch <laughs> people get older um, but we need our descendants to just step up and to maintain this there the one thing that we do not want to happen is to see that this is looking like the rest of the monuments that are on this capitol ground this is going to be the best looking monument forever. And that's where I see. And also that our young people become philanthropists, knowing how like you just went to your place of business and you said, can you support this? We need our young people to continue to do that. There's a tree planted uh, from Maud Coleman at Exemplar Grove. Mm -hmm. That's located at Front and Burbeck. There are trees that have been planted and uh, we were blessed that we had a tree planted for Maud and it will um, actually live 100 years. There's a beautiful bench that is there so when you go you can sit right there. There's a name there that says Maud Coleman and um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful, it's the Exemplars Park. There are other individuals who are there and uh, Homer Floyd is one of them, and there are others, but Maud Coleman, our descendant, Maud Coleman, is also in that Exemplars Park. So they are finally giving her her due. The new monument is located on the south lawn of the Pennsylvania Capitol building, the first monument to African Americans or women is located on the lawn at the Irvis Equality Circle. And here to speak about the importance of carrying on the work of Kaylee Roy Irvis is the dynamic leader, Representative Stephen Kenzie of Philadelphia. State Representative Stephen Kenzie, I served the 201st Legislative District, which is the Northwest section of Philadelphia. The committees that I currently serve on are the Appropriations, the Health, the Human Service, and Transportation. I currently also serve as the Subcommittee Chair of Health and Equities in the Black Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. Well, I'll, I'll put it into simple terms. The Speaker of the House literally controls the action of legislation that takes place in the House of Representatives. And what I mean by that is that the Speaker is the one who sets the schedule, the speaker is the one who also sets the legislation that will be presented to the members in the House for us to vote upon each and every day that we're here in session. The Speaker of the House literally is the most powerful member in the House of Representatives. You know, Kaylee Roy Orvis became, initially became the Speaker back in the mid, actually around the late 70s, 1977 I believe it was. In fact, it was 1977 to 1978. Then he came back and became speaker again, 1983 to 1988. But let me tell you, when Kay Leroy Irvis became the speaker here in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, he was the first African American selected to be speaker of any of the houses in the United States of America. So this gentleman was the first. And we're talking about in the 70s. So just think back to the 70s. This, and I'm talking about the state of Pennsylvania, we were still strife with dealing with um, racism. We're still dealing, we were still dealing with poverty. We're still dealing with lack of education in black and brown communities. But yet this gentleman was voted by his colleagues to serve as the speaker of a house. And, and let me be very clear. Back then, at that time, here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there were very few folks of color that, that actually served in the house. So for Kaylee Roy Urbis to maneuver, work with, and become the very speaker, the first African-American speaker of this house, that showed his ability to work with folks from all across the Commonwealth of, of Pennsylvania. We're talking about 67 counties, some rural, some suburban, 
some urban, but this gentleman was able to bring those folks together, garner enough votes to become the first African American speaker in any legislative body in the United States of America. Because of course the times back 100 years ago were much different and we know the struggles that folks of color had to go through. And I'm just talking about, you know, and, and you know, for one period of time you're elected and you're serving in, 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 a, in a body such as this. And then right after that, we're still dealing with the issues of slavery and whether or not black folks still have the right to vote. So, I mean, those are, so, those are some of the struggles that our ancestors have gone through, our forefathers had to deal with. And then to bring it all ahead 100 years later, as we're still dealing with voters' rights, as we're still dealing with equi um, equality, as we're still dealing with the obligation for folks to serve the Commonwealth, and I'm saying the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, K. Lee Irvis had a steady hand, and he was able to maneuver and navigate and continue on a course to ensure that not only people of color, but that all people, voices were heard. And he simply represented all people. And let me be clear, though, he was a black man, and he knew that. And so him, him serving here in this august body, he had to ensure that his blackness stood out because there were still folks calling them names. And, and to take it even a step further, Kaylee Lee Irvis, in fact, was one of the founders of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. And even though this gentleman was here, a powerful legislator, that group of body that he helped organize had to meet off campus in the private home of someone else under, under a cloud of darkness to ensure that they were not attacked simply for standing up for their own rights and ensuring that the folks throughout this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the black folks throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that their voices were heard. So, you know, again, we can talk about Reconstruction and, and 100 years later and talk about Kaylee Urbis and his leadership role and, and his steadfast and his vision to ensure that this Commonwealth was represented by folks of color and him leading the charge to establish the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, which is still going strong today. A little known fact that folks don't understand about, and I actually benefited from this, was there was a program called the Act 101 program. The Act 101 program was a program that ensured that folks coming from urban communities were still able to go to college and receive supports, um, the same supports that other folks that came from more affluent neighborhoods had. But I, I was a student through the Act 101 program, a program that Kaylee Lee Urban started to ensure that minority students were able to receive the supports necessary to achieve and complete a college education. And I stand as an example of, of, an, of, of an individual who benefited from legislation that Kaylee Roy Urbis did. But also his legacy, beyond setting certain standards, his legacy was about pulling folks together. I mean, again, when I go back to the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, and we're talking about members from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, and some in between there, but bringing these folks who had such a diverse community that they represented, but to bring them together under one common cause, and as to ensure that the voices of black people were heard. Kaylee Rue Urbis is the one who organized that. He was the one that worked with this community to ensure that they had a safe place to meet, to discuss, and build a foundation for folks like me to stand here today. So, I mean, there are so many, so many attributes that this gentleman has, and um, I'm just glad to, even though I've never met Kaylee Rue Urbis, but I've worked with some of the members who actually talked and worked with them, and just to hear the stories about Kaylee Rue Urbis, um, it's just tremendous, and I mean, this gentleman was the pace setter for folks like me today. First and foremost, I think that every single member in this august body have to understand the respect that this man has garnered for the work that he's done. And I want to be clear, the respect that this gentleman garnered for the work, and I'm saying the work, you know, there are folks that have the title and may not do the work, but this gentleman did the work. And I think it's first and foremost that folks understand that and respect the fact that this is a gentleman who worked hard while he served here in the House of Representatives. In addition to that, you know, as you walk outside and we see the statues that are out here and we got this nice lawn, I think that folks need to take heed and recognize that we named this lawn after a gentleman who deserves such recognition and more. I mean, this building is the K. Leroy Urbis building. The lawn, 
which some call the South Lawn, and we want to ensure that his name is attached to it. We have legislation to, that's working towards that. Um, we want to, we just want to recognize that this whole, this is just a small portion of the Capitol, but this is such a portion that we need to stand proud and recognize what Kaylee Roy Irvis has meant, not only here to Harrisburg, but to every single individual across the Commonwealth. So one, let's make sure that we, we give this gentleman the respect that he deserves. And then two, as we go outside and look at the statues and enjoy the trees and the, and the green grass, Let's ensure that, you know, let's keep that memory of Kaylee Moore Irvis alive. Let's keep the memory of all the great work that he's done and all the great deeds that he's done. And let's just keep the memory and the education piece so that way our children and their children can all recognize K. Leroy Irvis and what he stood for. Because if, if it weren't for folks like him, folks like me probably would not be here today. Along the pathway of the Peace Promenade, you will find this quote by Desmond Tutu. Do your little part. Every little part is a piece of the patchwork quilt that makes up peace. And here to share a message of commonality, camaraderie, and fellowship is the chairman of the board of IIPT, Mr. Timothy Marshall. Let me talk about common ground in the context of the special combination of the Peace Grove and the monument installation that you have spearheaded in Harrisburg. As Lou has said, that for us is a very special and unique model among our over 400 global peace parks. Um, because in addition to the peace growth, your, you, what you've done is critically important addition to African-American tourism in the United States and globally with, with the monuments. Um, we have, as we've been saying, peace parks in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, Australia, Central America, Canada, and the, and the United States, but none have the unique and special common ground of the Peace Grove and the monument installation. Mahatma Gandhi once said that the word destiny is an acronym for divinity established in ye, de-est in ye, divinity established in you. And so we here in Harrisburg, in the county of Dolphin, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, have heeded to the call of a brilliant man, Dr. Louis de L'Amour, and I'd like to ask Lou if he would give us some final thoughts and final words to encourage us as we embark upon another year of peace and progress. Lou? President Eisenhower once said that people of the world want peace so much that one of these days, the politicians are gonna to have to get out of the way and let them have it. Uh, what the Peace Through Tourism movement does it brings people together, people, ordinary people. And, and, uh, and as a result, uh, there is a realization that we all want a better future for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren. And um, uh, it, through this kind of dialogue with one another, which uh, is possible through the peace, through, more, through, through tourism movement, with uh, tourism, which unfortunately has been uh, on hold since the pandemic started. But uh, these are what will help us uh, bring a, a future uh, that we aspire to, peace within the global family and peace with our common home, planet Earth, which we know is in serious jeopardy as a result of climate change. So these are 
things that we all need to work towards. And so, in closing, I would like to thank the city of Harrisburg, the city council, the commissioners of Dauphin County, the House of Representatives and Senate of Pennsylvania, and the governor's office for giving us the opportunity, the stewardship, and purpose of establishing common ground, shared places of peace, and places for civic dialogue and engagement. I would also like to thank the Foundation for Enhancing Communities for providing us the fiscal ability and structural governance to create these programs here in the Commonwealth. And now in closing, I'd like to welcome a farewell by Representative Stephen Kenzie and a benediction by Rabbi Ron Murrow. Folks, let your voice be heard. Let your voice be heard. You know, none of us need to be silent about what we believe in and what we stand for. And I believe that if Kaylee Roy Irvis was here today with us, he would tell folks, let your voice be heard. I would like to uh, share with you a teaching that has helped guide me in my life, which is that of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who, uh, who, who said uh, uh, in the 1970s, um, he said to young people, don't, uh, don't despair. You know, I, I think uh, uh, so often it's, it's, it's easy when, there, when, you, when you encounter difficult times, uh, when you see uh, difficulties, and I, I'm sorry to say that I imagine even 100 years from now there will be, there will be inequity and there will be injustice and there will be hardships. I hope, I hope we will have made some headway. But I, I think you know, you look in the Bible till today, and and we human beings are complicated, and and we can do evil even as we can do good. But this this message of not giving into despair, um, I, I I think that would be one one thought I would want to share with young people and. And what just came to me in this moment is a teaching of, a, of another rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Karlabach, who said, um, if we had two hearts, we could, we could have one heart to love and one heart to hate. Uh, but since we only have one heart, we have to decide, you know, basically what, what, what we're gonna feed it. And uh, I, I, I really believe that um, we get to choose. We're, we're not, um, you know, our lives are not predetermined. We're not fated to, to be uh, in conflict. Uh, we get to choose uh, how we respond. And so my, my blessing for you would be to see each other, see our fellow human beings as exactly that, as human beings, 